Good morning, good afternoon, and if you're joining us from the West Coast, then a very early good morning to you. Staying sane in a remote world. I just hope that we're not contributing to the insanity by holding this meeting on Zoom. Or more to the point, how is the world of innovation supporting our well-being as this pandemic grinds on? For those who are first timers to the Tech Meets Design programming, a word about our project. Tech Meets Design was born in Jerusalem and its mission is to combine the world of technology and the world of design and create a nexus point between them. Now we see Jerusalem as the ideal venue for driving a global conversation around tech and design, largely because there are some unique assets here. There's a globally uh, ranked uh, art and design school, which is called B'Tselel, and uh, Hebrew University, another globally ranked academic institution, uh, B'Tselel uh, College of Engineering, and NGOs like New Spirit, and of course, the Jerusalem Development Authority, which is the government body that aims to promote and strengthen Jerusalem's tech ecosystem. Now, in classic tech meets design format, we tend to hone in on a specific sector and explore the nexus point between tech and design in that space. As our jumping off point today, I'm gonna to refer to a report that Startup Nation Central released in September, The New Digital Age. It offers a close look at how COVID has actually accelerated dramatically the transition to the new digital age in all its facets. We give a quote, uh, one quote from the report. As the world quickly adapts to the new reality, technologically and equally important, psychologically and socially, we may find ourselves reaching a new digital equilibrium in which moving more digital bits and fewer people and goods will be the new normal. So now we, be, we believe it's more important than ever to explore where tech, design, and wellness come together in the new digital age. That is the topic of today's meeting. And to do that, we have quite a lineup of speakers. It's an honor to introduce our headline speaker, Dr. Nina Vassen. Nina is a psychiatrist, an entrepreneur, a pioneer in digital mental health innovation, and did I mention a best-selling author and co-founder of a digital health startup. She is an assistant professor of psychiatry at Stanford University from where she has an MBA, and that is in addition to her MD from Harvard Medical School. Nina is active in the policy world, and she served on the health advisory uh, policy committee for both the uh, Biden and Obama presidential campaigns. So Nina, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Wendy. It's absolutely my pleasure to be here. Um, now, innovation in the mental health space is what you do. It's, it's really the drumbeat of the um, Stanford Mental Health Innovation Lab that you founded. Can you share with us what makes the lab brainstorm unique and what is some of the work that you're doing there? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, first, Wendy, I have to start off by telling you what a huge fan I am of Startup Nation, the book of Startup Nation Central. <laughs> I Even if I go back when I was in medical school, that's when a lot of the first digital health companies were really popping up, or the digital health companies certainly of this era. And I remember the first um, healthcare hackathon I went to, there was a whole stack of Startup Nation books and everyone was, you know, sharing it and, and just talking about what a rich and vibrant community has really been able to be created and how then I was in Boston at the time, how then people in Boston could learn about what had been, you know, what had happened and everything. So love, love the book, love everything you're doing and being Thank able you. to bring people together, especially recognizing the importance of this interdisciplinary dialogue between technology, design and other areas as well. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, so again, just wanted to say how much of, how much of a pleasure it is to be you. here. Um, Secondly, so to answer your question, so Brainstorm. So Brainstorm is Stanford's lab for mental health innovation. And it started a few years ago. And in particular, one of the main reasons why it started was we were looking at the number of startups that were out there in the mental health space. Every year, more and more startups, you know, being founded by really well-intentioned, passionate entrepreneurs 
a lot of investment money, just again, sit that same sort of curve going up in terms of what people hmm. are investing in. But there is a disconnect because while there is all this passion and excitement in creating these startups, when we looked at the actual outcomes and specifically looked to see how has health improved, how have the you know diseases or issues that we're targeting, how have they actually gotten better? There was this big disconnect. And so it seemed like there is a problem here and we need to figure out why that is. One of the things that, I, and so in this process, I ended up speaking with a number of stakeholders in the field, including entrepreneurs, you know, engineers, patients, doctors, investors, the whole kind of gamut. And there were a few key themes that really came up. One was that everyone felt very siloed in what they were doing, and especially by subject area. So, you know, doctors had their kind of approach of how to do things. Engineers had their approach. Designers had their approach. Mm. But there was no shared language. And recognizing the importance of bringing people together, having that interdisciplinary dialogue and shared understanding, exactly like Startup Nation Central is doing, that's mm. what one of the biggest things that people identified as their challenge and their need in order to really, you know, understand things deeper and get to that next level. So the foundation of Brainstorm and, you know, being at Stanford where we have a law school, an engineering school, a business school, a medical school, just really have the full kind of interdisciplinary um, studies there in the faculty. It's been a really rich environment to be able to then bring folks together. And the four areas we've focused on are medicine, business, technology, and design. So basis one, interdisciplinary. The second thing is really how do we, the, and the bigger question that we're answering is when we look at a problem like mental health, there are 2 billion people around the world who struggle with brain and behavioral health disorders. Now, when we look at the, you know, as a physician myself, when we look at the clinician side of the people who can provide care, it's really one of the biggest supply and demand mismatches that I've ever seen. And even if we were to double or triple the number of doctors, therapists, providers, which would take like a decade to do given training and everything, it still would just be a drop in the bucket. And what that shows is that we need to really be thinking about a whole new brand of solutions where it's not dependent on the bottleneck of the clinician and the clinician hour, but rather how do we create technologies that allow the impact of one clinician to scale then to you know, millions of people at a time. Because again, when like one quarter of the population is dealing with a problem or rather will deal with a problem over the course of their lifetime, we need something that's very different. So that's why technology was really the obvious answer in terms of what can we do differently. Um, and so that's really what we've tried, tried to look at is how do we then create technologies that address the whole spectrum of health from disease prevention through uh, diagnostics, treatment, long-term management, and, and, and everything kind of moving forward. So the areas that we focused on, there are three kind of key mission areas, technology, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and youth and young adults. And those are really in, in the terms of the population. It's looking, where can we make the biggest impact? Where can we focus on, you know, prevention? And, and also, you know, in the United States where the diversity, equity, inclusion piece is just, we're, we're so behind and issues like systemic racism have really, you know, intertwined into the healthcare system. How can we use design and use technology to really undo some of the kind of systemic wrongs that we have as a society? So that, that's what we focused on is that interdisciplinary element, being able to actually partner with companies and organizations to create new technologies. I'll, I'll talk about that in just a little bit. Um, and what we've seen is just really a whole culture change around how people want to be able to engage in designing new, new tools. So it's really um, tearing down the walls when you talk about the multidisciplinary approach and also um, moving psychological care off the couch, so to speak. Um, exactly. Now, this whole period of COVID um, has seen massive interruption, uh, massive opportunity for disruption in the mental health and, uh, and wellness space. So from where you're sitting, um, what do you see as opportunities for innovation in, let's call it the mental health and the wellness uh, space? And if you can also talk about this explosion of mental health uh, digital startups, 
Yes, absolutely. And it's interesting, you know, I mean, one of obviously one of the things that we're struggling with as, as a world right now is a number of businesses that because of COVID, because of the quarantine and pandemic, you know, are at, at risk and, and have, have had to close down. I think that that's, we've actually seen the opposite when it comes to the health and wellness space, and especially in the uh, context of digital, because that's the new world we're living in, right? And I want to actually take one quick step back to think about how did we actually get here and what are the big changes? I think that in this new kind of COVID context that we're living in, there have been probably two or three really big changes. And the first is actually culture. So, you know, if we think about a year ago, a lot of these digital tools that were out there had been out there for a while, but the adoption was actually relatively low. In the adoption one, if we think about like in the B2B sort of setting and like, you know, healthcare systems, hospitals, the kind of like businesses and clinics that might be adopting technology, but then in, as well on the B2C side in terms of having direct to consumer sort of programming and services and how much people are adopting technology. And really then overnight, there was this forcing function due to COVID, right, of then everyone having to adopt this stuff. And I'll even say at Stanford, you know, we're in the middle of Silicon Valley, like the patients we treat are Google, Apple, Facebook employees. And even as of January of this year, zero of our clinics in our department in, in, in psychiatry were mm -hmm. online clinics. Now, literally almost everyone is, right? And wow. again, it's not, and, and we've been trying to do this for years and years, but as I said, because the culture wasn't there, it was actually pretty difficult to mm -hmm. adopt. So now there's this culture where on both sides, on the provider side and on the on the patient side, again, and I'm talking, that's like kind of the more traditional healthcare arena, but even on the whole wellness side, you know, even like being able to do yoga online and things like that, right? It's, we're now used to and welcoming and able to actually do this stuff online. I'll give you an example just of my own clinic my own just, you know, patient care clinic, I used to have probably about like a 20% no-show rate before COVID. Now it's literally zero. Like everyone makes every appointment because they can, right? Because they're at home and, and they're able to just do that. And so that really then changes the abilities that we're able to, uh, the, the, the solutions we're able to actually have success in. But culture is number one. The second thing is policy. And, and I can speak to the U.S. in that we've had a number of policy changes that have really um, transform the way that we can engage. So one is, you know, we have uh, 50 states and when you get a medical license, you're licensed by your state. So you can provide care in that state itself. Now they've dissolved those state boundaries. So I, as someone who is licensed in California or in New York, could not only see people in California or New York, but also in you know, Kansas and Wyoming and Texas. And I think that really changes access in a very exciting way. Um, some other things are around payment. So digital sessions were not actually reimbursed by insurance. A lot of times they weren't reimbursed at all or they were reimbursed at a much lower rate. And now that's actually changed. So when, and the reason I just bring this up is this is the environment and the context in which people are innovating in. And when then the culture changes, when the policy changes and when the business models or business incentives change, it really creates an amazing space for innovation to flourish. And that's then what we've seen. Like literally, you know, in the lab, we see new companies coming about every day. And it, it's just been really incredible to see how when we're challenged, you know, the, the innovators in our society rise to that occasion and come up with all new ideas, everything from new ways of remote monitoring. A company that is, I've seen is um, they're looking at substance use. And, you know, if we think about uh, there, there have been increases in substance use over this time because people are stressed out and they've actually been able to design a wristband that detects alcohol content through your sweat. So instead of a breathalyzer or, you know, drawing your blood or something, it's a much easier way to actually see how someone's doing and then intervene when you see that those numbers are, you know, higher than, than you want them to be. So people are really pushing the pushing the envelope, if you will. Um, yes. And I, I'll talk about, I can talk about social media, but I'll, I can, maybe I can talk about that in just a sec. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, no, I, I think you're just making a powerful case that uh, geography has, it just ceased to mean anything. Um, uh, you know, that's given, enabled all that to, to happen. Now, in today's world, you could make the case that all products need design to take into consideration our um, mental health and well-being. Can you share any best practices for the for this tech and design community? I know you did something with Pinterest, which sounded really yes. interesting. 
Yes, exactly. I think that's a, that's a perfect example. So thank you for bringing that up. So, you know, Pinterest, so we worked with Pinterest um, and, and we built out a couple different things. Now, let me take a step back to explain, you know, what, what we were doing there. So, you know, Pinterest is this platform with over 350 million users. And where most people go to it is to look at things like, you know, like, like a couch. They're, you know, they're looking for a new couch and they want to they look at 20 different blue couches to figure out which one is right for them. Or, you know, they might be able to catalog recipes if they're trying to have more kind of healthy recipes in their life. And so it's not a place, the reason I bring, bring this up is it's not an obvious place to address an issue like health and wellness, right? Now, what the Pinterest founders found when looking through the kind of search query data is that the um, mental health, specifically things like depression or stress or anxiety, ended up being actually the fourth most common search term. Uh, categories of search terms in terms of what people were searching for when they came to this website. Hmm. And so what that made them realize is, wait, while we never thought this would be a place for people to address healthcare, it turns out that people are coming here looking for help. What can we offer them? So there were a few different things that we did. One is that we worked with them and we actually took the same sorts of treatments and therapies that we would do one-on-one -on -one with patients in a clinic and translated it into these short, like one to five minute exercises that you can do on the Pinterest platform. So now when you go to the platform and you type in depression or tips after a breakup or stress, you actually get this a new pop-up with a whole host of what we call micro treatments. These, you know, evidence-based scientific, scientifically rigorous treatments that you can do on the platform itself to this address is issues that you're, you're This is really crazy. <laughs> right, right. And then the second thing actually that I think yeah. in some ways is almost like, that's cool. The thing I actually think is even more cool, and especially for the designers in the audience, is that we actually looked at how do we change the platform itself? So for example, mm. you know, the stress and depression are obviously one area. On the other end of the mm. severity are things like suicide and self-harm. Mm. And how do we create an experience such that if someone is looking for content like that, they don't end up in this like doom scroll downward spiral of seeing darker and darker content, but instead there's an opportunity to intervene and help them get the help that they might need in that moment. And so we really thought about what are the things that the platform is doing, that the technology is doing that could reinforce or actually potentially do harm? And, you know, in medicine, mm. we take this oath that wow. first do no harm. And we want to really make sure that these tech products are following that as well. So some of the things that we did, one is we worked with the, with the engineers around the algorithms of what comes up, what triggers something else, how do we, how do people engage in this content. And after teaching them about different elements around suicide and self-harm, we're actually able to change the algorithm such that now there's actually been over just like a few months, I think like less than six months, there was an 88% decrease in self-harm content on the platform. And so that was just really big change in how users engage with something and where design can uniquely come in to really mm -hmm. dramatically transform an experience. One more quick example I'll give is, you know, if you go to Google mm -hmm. and you start typing something in, it'll pr it predicts what you what it thinks you're typing, right? And so if yes, it's like, you know, we know that all too well. To, yes, it, all, all too well, right? It's yeah. almost like a little <laughs> creepy, but like also pretty cool <laughs> finding that balance. But on Pinterest, what we realized is that same thing, like if you're typing in something potentially dangerous or something that might make things worse, how do we actually then make sure to not automatically fill it in? So we're not suggesting something that might take mm. you to a darker place. So I think all of this is just really to show um, that the, the opportunity when we bring designers to the table with engineers and, and then also with like content experts, right? In the case of mental health and well-being, with you know psychiatrists like myself, mm. in the case of um you know, other elements of trust and safety to have, you know, a lawyer at the table or someone who works in like child exploitation or things like that, and really bring people together so that we can then come up with new creative solutions that neither, no individual would really be able to come up with themselves. Wow, I actually think that that um, Pinterest could actually be a case study. I could imagine, you know, designers and engineers doing good in the uh, mental health space. We'll save that one for next time. Uh, so we just have time for one more question. And I actually heard you on a podcast recently, um, the armchair expert with Dax Shepard. And it was a fascinating podcast. I recommend it to, to everyone that's with us today, but you talked there about how medicine and healthcare, including mental, mental healthcare is becoming democratized and personalized. Now, I know that you're also the chief medical officer at Real, which is a digital uh, therapy startup. 
what can you share with us about how you can scale mental health services, which are very personal, and design them in such a way to have an impact at the same time? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm actually here in the real studio right now, which is I'm, I'm in New York right now. I was in Palo Alto just a few days ago. And, and I say I share that story because real was actually originally meant to be an in person studio. Um, it was meant to be this, you know, almost like a we work type of place, a physical environment to be able to come and get direct mental health care services in a way that, you know, is not the kind of standard cold doctor's office, but something that's warm and inviting and creates community. And that's what we were actually planning to launch, to launch in uh, uh, April of this year. And then like every story for 2020, and then COVID happened. And what we realized is that, you know, the studio is going to be closed. We don't know when we'd actually be able to open it. And then we also realized, but there's this huge need, right? Because even in those first few weeks of the pandemic, we were seeing concerns around mental health off the charts, more higher than we'd ever seen before. And so literally mm -hmm. over the course of eight days, the engineers and designers came together to create a digital product from what for like a year had been planned to be an in-person studio. And now since then, for the last wow. year, we're, you know, about us, I guess, I guess six months or so, we've been this fully mm -hmm. digital product that actually now launched about a couple months ago to the broader, you know, broader member base. And I bring that up because one, I think just that itself shows again, the ingenuity, right? Like, you know, we're all, as we've right. evolved, we've evolved to really rise to challenges and to see where when this global pandemic hits, what innovative entrepreneurs, you know, innovators, entrepreneurs, engineers, designers are able to do to really push things forward. And I think that that's a great example of that. Now, it also shows question, the agility right, of this team. Yeah, exactly. Yes, that, that's a perfect, perfect way to say it. And to your point, you know, the way that people traditionally think about mental health care, it is this very deeply personalized, but personalized in the sense of one on one. Um, which I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. Um, and what we've realized is the one-on-one -on -one model, there's really, there's no way to really, really make that scale to, as I said, you know, 2 billion people. Instead, what we realized is what, how do we then create a product that anyone can access? And when we think about access that, you know, one, it's really low cost. So Real has a membership that's less than $1 a day. And when you compare that mm. to um, you know, when you compare that to traditional healthcare, you know, one session with a therapist might be something like two hundred, three hundred dollars. So to be able to basically, you know, in, uh, pay for uh, in a year what you would for one session is very, very different. But then, two, when we say we have the phrase "meet people where they are." And when it comes to mental health, that's a really, because of stigma, because of like education and a lot of misinformation, it's important to meet people where they are as a starting point. And that both has this figurative sense as well as very literal sense, which is, you know, when people see me in my own clinic, you know, they might, they might have an appointment of like 2 p.m. on Wednesday. But when you're really struggling with your mental health, it's not 2 p.m. on Wednesday. It's probably like, you know, 7 p.m. or midnight. You've woken up in the middle of the night or, you know, like something like that. And you're not usually able to contact a doctor or contact someone who you need at that time. And so what we realized is we wanted to be able to provide what we're calling an asynchronous model where anytime you need the help, you can like log on to this platform and get it in the way that you need it and and not then have to be reliant on someone else to schedule someone else's time. So that's part one. The second part to the point of, um, you know, I was saying the one to one model, what we've actually been looking at instead is the group model. And what's really interesting is on the therapy side, group therapy is actually just as effective as one on one therapy. And all of the data really shows that. But the world that we were living in before COVID, group therapy looked like, you know, 12 people or 20 people having to be in the same room at the same time every week. And with all the busy schedules everyone has, it's really hard to get that consistency. Now that everything is digital and, you know, you can even call on your phone if you're not at home or, you know, if you're like, you know, exactly. driving somewhere, you can still call in. It's allowed for group therapy to flourish in a way that it really was very difficult to before COVID. And the example I make here is if you look at something like education, we've built an entire education system around this model of groups or classes, right? You have 20, 30 kids in a class in college, you know, it could be anywhere from what, five to 500. And that's how we deliver education now. There is still a one on one model, right? Having a tutor who's teaching you a particular subject. If you think, you know, back in the day, certainly like 500 years ago, you know, that's how a lot of teaching got done. But it doesn't have to be that way. 
And when we think about why is therapy done one-on-one, -on -one, it's not because scientific evidence tells us this is the best thing. It's only because it's just a scheduling logistical thing that seemed to make sense in the business model context of what healthcare looked like. But just as not all education needs to be a tutor and student relationship, and we can actually have these groups, that's what we've been looking at is how do we actually take that same analogy mm -hmm. and teach people about their mental health and well-being, teach them about medications, teach them about you know, exercise in a group setting so that they both benefit from community, you know, exactly as you're doing with Startup Nation Central, as well as then learning what they need at scale, such that then one hour of my time, I can reach 50, 100 people instead of that being the number of people I would reach in a month. So you're really talking about a flattening of the entire system. I mean, it's, it's very yeah. powerful when you really think about what COVID has brought about. Um, I feel like we could go on for a really long time and I I'd actually like to do that, but we, um, I'm going to invite you to actually stick around because we have a, a, a super interesting uh, panel right now um, with a group of investors that actually invest in this space, but I'd love to ask you to stick around just so that I can come back to you at the end and just get your comments on what you hear um, from this panel. So thank you. I would really be delighted, absolutely delighted, and great. delighted to get to hear from this panel, and thank you again. Well. It's been a pleasure having you with us. Really appreciate the wide ranging <laughs> topics that we covered. Okay, so here's, here's um, what I'm gonna invite everyone who's, um, who's joined us to think about. In the first half of 2020, there's been an explosive growth in mental health startup funding as compared to prior years. Just to throw out three quick data points, um, in Q1 alone of this year, Funding for mental health startups reached $462 million um, compared with $750 million for all of last year. Second point is that COVID is actually driving some pretty dramatic regulatory changes that are a positive tailwind for many mental health startups. I think that, again, relates to some of the flattening of the whole system that we just heard from Nina. And thirdly, Many CEOs of mental health and wellness startups are reporting increased traffic and engagement, sometimes up to 15x month over to month growth uh, during COVID. Now in Israel, it's, it's a younger ecosystem. There are about 100 companies in, in the mental health space. And the, just to give you a sense of the investment numbers for this year, um, we're talking about $74 million invested in uh, to date in mental health uh, startups compared with $50 million last year. Um, some of the companies that have gotten um, pretty significant rounds are Intuition Robotics, which interestingly is a robot that can keep uh, people who are lonely uh, or isolated uh, company. The second one is Nanit, which actually takes um, the sleep monitor for babies to a whole other level. And the third is XR Health. Now, Israel's startup scene has traditionally focused more on being B2B. But what we're seeing is that more entrepreneurs are going the way of building uh, consumer-focused products. So on the Startup Nation Finder platform, which is our database that maps the whole Israeli tech sector, um, we're seeing about 30 startups that have developed consumer well-being solutions. And that's just a small part of the wellness industry here that has about 200 companies. Um, it's about, I want to say it's a young industry. There's about a third uh, of the consumer well-being companies that are less than three years old. So we're going to take a look at um, what the investors have to say uh, in this space. And I'm pleased to um, drill down on uh, their perspective. We have a terrific panel lined up. So for all the startups that are with us this morning, here's your chance to hear what these VCs are really looking for. So we have with us two uh, VC um, whose funds invest mainly in this sector and the founder of a mental health startup. So I'm just gonna give you a, a really a quick, uh, quick bio of our lineup. Uh, we have Mary Polacek, who is the CEO of Joint Ventures, uh, of Joy Ventures. Prior to uh, founding uh, Joy Ventures, Mary co-founded and led Israel Brain Technologies. And I love how she describes Joy Ventures as a science-backed consumer products for well-being. 
And if you look at Joy Ventures website, it says their mission is to advance the science of everyday joy. Um, Jonathan Friedman is a partner at Lionbird, which is another focus, another fund focused on digital health. And uh, from your mission, Jonathan, I understand that Lionbird aspires to be the best pre-scale digital health investors out there. Um, Jonathan also serves on the advisory board of the Yale University Center for Digital Health and Innovation. And just to tip our hat um, on, the, on the founder side, we have uh, Boaz Gaon, who is the CEO of Wisdo.com. Uh, and I'm gonna actually invite Boaz in a minute to, uh, to share more about what, uh, what, what Wisdo is doing, because it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting, um, it's a really interesting um, startup, actually company. Now, for Mary and Jonathan, Okay, I'm going to key off what Nina just said in that we're now seeing more design oriented consumer centered companies, many of which are focusing on digital health, mental health and wellness. You both must have really interesting deal flow. Based on the wide range of ideas and products that you're being pitched on, what can you say in the wellness space that's standing out right now? And at the same time, I'm going to ask if each of you can relate. Uh, is there anything special in Israel that's standing out on this in this space? So, Mary, I'm going to start with you. Thanks, Wendy. It's great to see you and great to be on this panel. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so this certainly has been an interesting time. Uh, and the, the interest that we have in this space is obviously comes before, uh, you know, the current global pandemic. Obviously, the recent year, as um, Nina said, has, has accelerated uh, a lot of the awareness and, and demand, uh, you know, but we've been looking for uh, innovative solutions on stress, anxiety, sleep issues, loneliness uh, for quite some time. And as, uh, as has been mentioned, it is still a very young category and the first uh, generation of products are still uh, in the process of proving themselves, proving their value, uh, both in terms of the effect that they have on the user, the ability to really create some kind of a change, uh, but also, uh, mm -hmm. as has been mentioned, in the design aspect, which is, you know, how do you create a product that's not only effective, but also uh, can be seamlessly integrated into people's everyday lives uh, so that they'll indeed use the product and, and benefit from the product. Uh, in terms of what we've been seeing, um, there are various technologies that we believe uh, can really help to, um, to create this, this, uh, this sort of immersive, uh, uh, engaging experience uh, that will help people kind of feel good and take better care of themselves. So for example, uh, you know, gaming platforms uh, that can really in the past, you know, may have been used for, uh, for competitive uh, content and violent content, we can use gaming, for example, as a tool to uh, to start helping people work on their uh, soft skills, on their social interaction, uh, on feeling good, uh, and, and you know, enhancing their emotional resilience. Uh, obviously, uh, virtual reality and various other uh, immersive type of technologies, and any technologies in that uh, case that uh, create sensory stimulation, are very interesting to us. Okay. Now, Jonathan, same question for you. Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, even get a little bit more specific on, on some companies that, that I've been recently excited about. Uh, we recently actually invested in a company in the post-hospital discharge space, which I think is a great example. You know, you, you would imagine by now that the mental and behavioral health space is, is very crowded given the attention and the funding it's gotten. But you know, I think that it needs to be integrated intelligently into the patient journey, especially in specific areas, you know, where there's where there's times of crisis and, and there's a need for, for a trusted advisor. And, and also specific demographics, uh, they need a kind of custom solution. So if you think in those terms, there's, there's still plenty of uh, white space ahead. So, you know, for example, there's, there's that company that I mentioned. There's another one that I'm speaking with that is dealing specifically with business owner depression. You know, 60% of, of business owners feel depressed more than once a week. I'm sure 
the startups on the call, you know, the founders can can relate. Uh, this is also Main Street, though. It's not just uh, the technology companies. And I'm sure that's increased since coronavirus. And when you think about them, you know, this is a segment with very little free time, strange work hours, unique challenges, but a strong need. And so really the, the language, the the data integrations and the marketing can all be customized, uh, you know, with a design oriented thinking approach, uh, you know, to really differentiate in some of these categories. And Jonathan, anything interesting coming out of Israel that you'd like to share? Yeah, so so those particular companies are from Israel. Um, there's even one more a company that it's funny, Miri introduced me to called Calmago. Uh, it's actually a, a product that helps you calm down using two proven anxiety relief methods in one device. So number one, it's it has an adaptive technology that gives you personalized feedback on your exhalation and it kind of uh, activates the parasympathetic nervous system by making sure that you exhale you know, to your personal maximum uh, capability. And then also there's multi-sensory stimulation, you know, calming lights, vibration, scent, touch that allow you to achieve mindfulness and it's interesting there's a growing number of studies that show effective breathing techniques can actually help with a wide range of issues anxiety pain insomnia and it's really the lowest common denominator for calming the body and mind yet it's difficult to implement so it's really uh, a great example i think of of if you can just come up with a solution that that is consumer grade and and leads to high satisfaction it can lead to high adherence which is the best you know drug you can you can hope for it's interesting that a um a startup dedicated to uh to being calm is coming out of israel that's that's somewhat fitting actually <laughs> um so uh before we turn to boaz miri i just have another question for you uh, i know that joy ventures is is not a traditional vc uh you also have a venture creation platform can you share with us why you chose to go that route and, and what value is it bringing? Sure, yeah. So when we started out uh, investing primarily locally, we saw that there are, uh, it's still a very young category, uh, still not that many companies, as has been mentioned. And we felt that it was really our uh, our job, our responsibility to create that, um, to increase the market awareness, to get founders uh, excited about this huge market opportunity, which we believe is, you know, is, is continuing to grow at a very fast pace, and uh, to help really to catalyze the generation of, uh, of, of innovation and new ventures. So we have actually a uh, sort of multi-pronged approach there. Um, one thing we do is we, uh, we look for uh, innovative technologies in academia uh, that could potentially be turned mm -hmm. into products. We work with entrepreneurs. We have an entrepreneur in residence program that we actually just launched this year, working with uh, experienced founders who are kind of looking for their next uh, adventure, their next uh, startup, and are interested in this domain. Uh, we invite them to come in, spend uh, a few months with us, and kind of learn about the market, learn about the um, you know the current landscape, and try to think of uh, ideas for new companies, for new products. And we also work with the greater community, um, partnering with um, with various schools and running courses uh, that also promote sort of understanding of uh, this space and promote ideation and um, yeah, new new venture creation. So you're really taking on the whole ecosystem in all its facets. It sounds. It sounds We're terrific. trying. <laughs> um, now, Boaz, I want to turn to you. Um, I, I found what you're doing at Wisdo um, fascinating and actually a little bit hard to, to get my arms around. Um, what I understood is that Wisdo is trying to foster meaningful connections around shared and sometimes difficult experiences. Can you Tell us, first of all, what exactly is Wisdo doing? And how do you create a safe environment, let's call it design from a design perspective and otherwise, for that kind of openness that's in the digital space? Absolutely. And thank you for inviting me to this very distinguished forum. Um, yeah, so, you know, at, at its core, Wisdo something, does something very, very simple, which is to increase social health and wellness by introducing you to people who can make you feel better about where you are and where you might get to. 
Uh, and we do that by changing the way introductions are made online instead of introducing people online to uh, the type of people that you would, would usually find online, which are people who are A, uh, ranked as popular, uh, and B, people who are already in your social graph somehow. We connect people who are in the midst of or have just embarked on a major life journey. Um, and as you said, it can be a positive thing, it can be a less positive thing. Uh, we continuously connect them to people who answer the three different criteria. One is people who've been there. Uh, people can say, I understand, I'm not going to judge you, this is not a popularity contest. The second is uh, people who've been ranked as helpful rather than popular, mm -hmm. uh, early, earning badges along the way. And thirdly, people who can be available to them for that type of conversation within seconds. Um, and the way we make those matches is really interesting, which is basically we crowdsource the shape of any co consequential life journey. We invite mm -hmm. every new user to map exactly where they are on the trajectory of that experience in a very granular way. And then we capture that data and continuously make those introductions, um, which is why we've been able to lower loneliness by 60% within two weeks of using the product and increase social resilience by 6% in the same time frame. So that is basically mm. what Wisdo does. Um, to your other question, um, you know, safety and trust, uh, I'd say, are one of the main assets that we've been uh, focused on uh, since we launched, um, you know, three, three and a half years ago. Um, also, why we won, you know, quite a few awards. Um, and, and the reason that we've been able to do that is because and that goes back to, to your question to all of these you know, distinguished panel members, is that users expect more. Um, and I think this trend has accelerated since COVID. Uh, people are no longer, and by people I mean you know, consumers online, are no longer excited about the magic of being able to connect to anyone on earth. Uh, they're also somewhat exhausted of this popularity high school contest that all of us have been kind of playing for about 20 plus years. Uh, they're looking for a better uh, sense of connection, um, which is why they, you know, many of them are, are willing to step up and play a role ensuring that type of experience to other folks. Um, and more specifically to your question, what we've done uh, is we've created a hierarchy of community where the more helpful you are on the platform, um, you earn editing rights along the way that are able to basically distribute the load of keeping the platform safe with a lot of technology and AI that comes that comes into play. So if you had companies like Wikipedia doing that for knowledge and you had companies like Waze doing it for transportation, you now have companies like Wisdo and I guess others um, who can do that um, to foster a deeper sense of connection between individuals. Okay, that's, uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, I, I'm going to ask one more question of, um, of Boaz and then actually turn it back to, to Miri and Jonathan. I also want to point out for the, um, the audience that's with us online, uh, we're going to have time for a couple of questions at the end. So if you want to send in any questions through Zoom, um, feel free to do that. Um, Boaz, just very briefly, because I think we're running up against the clock here. Um, any advice that you can give for entrepreneurs uh, that are looking to integrate smart design into their mental health and wellness startups? Um, yeah, you know, first I, I would say, um, you know, commit to it. I think that along the way, um, a lot of shortcuts are going to present themselves and elude you to or delude you to think that they would pay off um, along the way and they never do. Um, again, it, maybe it's the times that we're living in. Um, maybe it's just that, again, the online um, kind of universe has been around for quite a few years now and people have really raised the bar on what they, they would expect. Um, eventually, it's going to be very difficult to engage and retain users for long cycles of time. And by that, I mean years. Uh, you know, that is where we put the bar. Uh, if the, uh, you know, if the, if the UX, UI, just overall design experience is less than, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the best that you can make it. Um, and the second thing that I would say, which is, you know, uh, fairly obvious is hire really great people, uh, but not only talented people, but also people who are motivated to commit to that type of execution because, 
um, something happened along the way in their own personal lives that have made it very clear why you know it's important to spend your years as an entrepreneur doing something that eventually helps people rather than mm -hmm. something that doesn't. Um, so I think okay. if you can commit to those two things and do that consistently, you're going to be in better shape. Sounds like very sound advice, I have to say. Um, so we're going to close um, actually with uh, Mary and Jonathan just very briefly. Um, actually, I'm going to ask you a two-part question. You can give a very brief answer. Uh, first of all, if you can just share with us what criteria you think is needed in order to stand out in the market from your investor perspective. And Nina actually texted uh, a very good question. If you could relate to um, this whole uh, tension between engagement and effectiveness. So two part question <laughs> for Mary and Jonathan. So in a way, I think Nina kind of answered the answered the question for me in a way because um, that, and this is the big challenge is, is we're exactly looking for companies that can do both, right? Um, on the one hand, they create this amazingly designed experience. Uh, and that's how we work with our entrepreneurs too. We, you know, we connect them to designers. We've also are actually one of our first investments um, was a graduate of, of, a des of design uh, school and uh, a neuro uh, bachelor's degree in neuroscience. So she combined those two uh, components, uh, designing this beautiful uh, biofeedback product that um, that is both lovely to use and effective. Um, so that combined with, you know, with using uh, methodologies that are efficacious, that's that's the ultimate uh, challenge and where we you know, we think that the companies that will be able to bring products that, um, that are able to achieve both will really be the ones that uh, truly succeed. Okay, thank you. Um, Jonathan. Sure. Uh, so to be brief, one of the things I think are interesting in the category are medically proven but consumer grade solutions. So, you know, I think where the brand oriented kind of consumer product founders have a big edge and a lot of a lot to teach us in healthcare is, you know, the best practices around patient activation and retention or what we call adherence in healthcare and 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 that's critical if you're going to you know to to make an impact. And of course though, you know, Consumer D to C, direct to consumer marketing, seems to only scale to a certain point. And oftentimes, when you're dealing with health, you have to find a price carrier, a third party that that will pay for the intervention. And so you need to know how to package your value to tap into the massive pool of healthcare spend, whether that be as a supplemental benefit or as a reimbursed product. And and so we're looking for companies that know how to straddle both worlds. Okay, I hope the, uh, the startups that are with us are listening very carefully. Um, I've got one question uh, for the panel from Carmi Soder. Are you involved in networking uh, groups such as M Health Israel and what other groups do you recommend? If either of you wanna to respond to that briefly. Uh, anyone who wants to reach out to us directly, you know, we actually answer all the emails from our website. We try to make ourselves accessible, but you know, unfortunately, we don't have so much time in the day for all these different groups. You, you know, an industry has arrived when there's a conference around it and and a community, which is a great sign. But then there's also, you know, probably a lot of noise and a lot of uh, you know activity, and and we all have our kind of day jobs that we're focusing on. So. I personally, you know, am unfortunately not always uh, able to attend all those events, but, uh, you know, always happy to chat. Okay, well, thank you. I want to thank uh, Miri, Jonathan, and Boaz. Super interesting conversation here, too. I feel like we could go on a lot longer because this is clearly a, a developing space. Um, but we'd love to have you back another time to continue the conversation. Uh, and now we're going to go back to Nina. Um, because I understand, Nina, we actually have a question from our audience for you uh, from Jonathan Evans, uh, who's asking, what do you view as the best opportunity to add a tech platform to current telepsychiatry delivery of care to support the standard of care while maximizing productivity? That's a phenomenal question. And I have one answer for that, which is measurement. 
When we look at the field of mental health and well-being compared to other areas of medicine, mm. our ability to measure how people are doing is, um, well, well, one, actually, that was before our ability, the likelihood, the frequency with which we measure is really like 10, 20% compared to other areas of medicine. If we look at something like surgery or now infectious disease, everything is measured from how you're doing to your progress. Mm. I use diabetes as an example. Any diabetic who's been diagnosed is tracking their levels of blood sugar and they make changes in their life accordingly. And so I think that what telepsychiatry uh, enables is, and, and by having a platform, is for both people on the sides of the platform, both the patient and the doctor, to be able to make metrics a much more like rigorous and regular part of the experience. The first thing that that does is it changes stigma and changes culture. When you're able to fill, so in, in mental health, the way that we measure is we have these scales where you're answering questions. For example, if you are if you might be depressed over the last two weeks, how was your sleep? How mm -hmm. was your appetite? How was your motivation? And by answering those scales, it gives us a sense if, are you depressed? And if so, how depressed are you? And it really helps us break down where you are on that spectrum from illness uh -huh. to wellness, mm -hmm. as well as then if you've had a treatment, like let's say you're starting a medication, you're starting therapy, how much better are you getting and how quick, quickly? Now, because mm -hmm. stigma is still really, I think, the first biggest barrier in addressing any element of mental health and well-being, to be able to bring in a metric really makes things more objective and destigmatizes it. It's not just, oh, I feel bad. It's, oh, my numbers are telling me I need to work on X, Y, or Z. So that's number one. The second then is really changing the culture so that there's more proactivity. When I, same thing, if I start someone on medication, if they don't come back to me for a month, but then they're actually taking these scales, let's say once a week, I can see, are they on the upward? Are they on the downward? In particular, if someone's like really low a few weeks after, then I know, oh, wait, I need to triage differently. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't wait a month for them to come back. I should go talk to them today and see what we can do to change things immediately because things are not working. Mm -hmm. And I Got think it. that if measurement can really be a part of the daily experience, it changes the consumer's ability to understand what's going on with them um, and let them be proactive about this whole thing, as well as it just allows for a culture that really elevates our understanding on that personal level. Mm. Okay, well, actually, since you mentioned this whole notion of this personalized treatment, I, I should flag that there's an interesting startup in, uh, in Jerusalem called Genetica Plus that Nina, I invite you to take a look at as well as our audience, because it, it really takes the whole personalization of depression treatment to, to a whole other level. We've got one last question for you, Nina, and then we really need to wrap up because we like to, to stick to our one hour commitment. Um, the question is from Louise Carvalho. How do you see the expansion of all these movements and funding to support low and medium income countries? I mean, I think that's way, way overdue. Uh, honestly, you know, I, I'm in the middle of Silicon Valley and I think a lot of products get created for some, in some cases, you know, the working well, some cases really just kind of like the upper classes that are already more, more aware of things, more kind of in tune with what's going on. And both if we look at a single society being able to address that part of the population, as well as then on this global level, um, you know, we really need to do more to properly design for for the, the whole spectrum. Um, and I think that as this is actually really a great opportunity for designers to think of the current, a lot of the current products are not really well suited for you know, lower resource environments or lower resource communities within even you know, broader, more kind of you know, developed nations. What can we do then to change the design so that it really does, it, it is accessible, it is friendly, it makes people feel like this product was created for them and not just for, you know, like upper middle class, you know, person who's already kind of really tech savvy and things like that. It's, it's a beautiful design question. I think it brings in elements of culture and it brings in, you know, sociology and many, many things. And so I think this is a great challenge actually for the audience today is to really think about the lower middle kind of income countries, as, as I said, as well as populations. Um, and what, what can I do to really reach them in a way that they're not currently being reached? Okay, great. 
Well, Nina, I can't thank you enough for joining us. However many time zones you are away, it really felt like you were together at the Start of Nation Central Broadcast Studio here in Tel Aviv. And I do hope that we'll get to host you here in person very soon. Uh, I, I think you really gave us a window into this um, new but flourishing ecosystem and, and really a sense of how people all over the world are getting off the couch and relying on a, a wide range of tools, uh, chatbots and apps and digital support groups to combat some of these modern day issues that are so prevalent, uh, especially during a, uh, a pandemic. Um, if we learned nothing else, it's that as we're moving into this new digital age, uh, the opportunity to bring uh, design together with technology and wellness with mental health technologies is really unlimited. And I, I do wanna thank everyone that joined us today. Uh, we hope that you will stay in this conversation with us at Tech Meets Design. Uh, we are actually going to be releasing a, um, a website where you'll be exposed to a lot more Tech Meets Design content uh, in the first quarter of 2021. And you also wanna look out for a, um, some marketing campaign that we'll be doing our early next year together with the Jerusalem Foundation where we're going to be highlighting some of the unique technologies that are coming out of Jerusalem uh, with a special emphasis on the design angle. So thank you again for joining us. Again, I hope that we didn't contribute to more insanity by meeting on Zoom. But uh, we appreciate your being with us. And, and Nina, thank you again. And thanks to that terrific panel. We appreciate it. Have a thank good morning. So Have a good thank afternoon. Thank you, Lindy. This was tremendous. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.